good call. Good morning, everyone. Is this on so you can hear me in this room? Okay, just good. Ah, how's everybody doing? Happy St. Patrick's Day. So I have not been here these last four sessions. So I feel a little guilty being the person to, to close this up because I might not actually incorporate everything that we've talked about. Um, but we are, I'm going to start by saying we are, this is not going to sum everything up, solve all the problems. We're not going to come away today. I wish that was the case, but this is, this is still all the beginning, beginning of all of this process for us. Um, what I would like to do, and I don't know if we often do is I'd like to open us in prayer. So if you join me in prayer, dear God, we give you thanks for the early spring as disconcerting as it may be, but it's so early. We give you thanks that all of the leaves and the branches and the plants that we put to bed this fall have created the compost and the nutrients that give life to everything that is rising for us this spring. We are reminded that everything that has come before is food, is nourishment for what is yet to come, both in the ground and in our lives and in this congregation. Nothing that you have created or have done is waste. It is all for what is yet to come. Please be with us today and in the many, many days ahead as we continue to try and discern your will for this congregation, for all of the potential we have to make change in the lives of our members in the lives of the people in the community of Rochester and around the world. We ask all this in your name. Amen. We are so blessed to have such a foundation from this congregation of everything that has come from the decades and centuries before from the three congregations. And our endowment is an indication of that. We're not going to, we're going to talk a little bit about our endowment today, but I just want to always recognize all that has come before us, all that has laid into that soil of what can grow from this. This story was written, the seeds of this story were written a long, long time ago. Today and in the future, we have to tend those seeds, but this has been written for a long, long time. I want to start by sharing a brief story. Some of you are more familiar with this than others, but this is a story about sort of what has happened at Camp Whitman. So I think as many of you know, I grew up at camp. I had always wanted to be the director, but never thought I could be the director because I wasn't a pastor or wasn't intending to be a pastor. And in my teens and twenties, I feverishly, wrote down ideas of what I would do with the camp if I could become the director. I had pages and pages. I had a document this thick in my teens and 20s of how I would lay out the property, what I would do. I was always fascinated by what was potential there. Fast forward 20-ish years later, and I received a call to become the director of camp. And very early into that call, I had to reckon with something very um, challenging, which is that I had to accept that it was more than likely that I would be the person to close the camp, that the camp was not financially doing well, the enrollment was down, there was murmurings in the presbyteries, that the best thing to do would be to close the camp, to sell the money and put it back into the churches or the community. And what I first had to do was grieve that that might be what I had to do, but accept that that was a possibility. Ultimately, as I think you all know, that is not what has happened yet today, but it was important for me to understand that that was a possibility. And I say that because we do not know what the future of this church is. But I do think we have to accept that there might be a possibility that we sell this building or we close this building but also that we might not, we don't know. 
But just a reminder that we don't know what God has in store for us yet, but that we have to be open to all of those possibilities. So in looking through the notes from the last couple of weeks, I came away with a couple of takeaways. And as we begin today, I just want to list out, I think there's are five things here that I think we can agree on, but I'm going to say them out loud and I'll share them in the notes. I think we can all agree that we know our membership and weekly attendance has decreased steadily over the last number of years. Everybody agree that that feels like a reality, right? Can we agree that and maybe this number specifically, we're gonna, but I have budgets I'm going to pass out to you all. Our pledges are not covering, covering even half of our congregational expenses. And our total income, whether that's from building rentals, events, weddings, and pledges, only covers 40% of our total budget. 40%. 40%. 60% of that is pulled from the endowment. Number three. Our endowment is being pulled at higher levels each year. We used to try and stick to that kind of magic four to five percent that you know is recommended, but I think this year was nine point seven seven percent. So it's just a fact. It's not a judgment. Just where we are. Number four, we are continuing to grieve what has been lost. That's a process for all of us. It's we miss the days when we had vibrant youth choirs and we had vibrant youth groups. We miss the days when we had more fellowship events. That feeling is real and it is okay. But also number five, that we have renewed energy and enthusiasm for building a new future. Do we agree with that? Yeah, that's the, and that's the good thing. So I want us to hold all of those things in place as kind of as we continue to move forward and I'll share all of these. We can move to the next slide. So I just want to do a little recap about not just us, but what sort of happens in the church world as a whole. I'm going to give you a disclaimer. The content I pulled from this was from a writer who comes from a more conservative background, but this is not a conservative theology. This is, this is truth. But if you Google these things and you're like, oh, this guy's Southern Baptist, you can do that. However, that Southern Baptist church that he serves uh, was expelled from the denomination for appointing a female pastor. So I do feel good about maybe where this man is coming from. <laughs> so the note here is that there are five pillars of what a typical congregation has comprised of what it does. Fellowship, discipleship, and I'm going to use the word education there because sometimes something like discipleship feels a little icky to us. You know, that might not feel good. Worship, ministry, and I'm going to say ministry in our context is both service, it's mission giving, and it's justice work. That's kind of ministry, what we do out in the world. And evangelism, which feels even more icky, I think, to us, but we're going to say it. And this didn't, oh, it did capitalize it. Sharing the word, so like the Bible, and spreading the word, just letting people know what we're doing. We're not particularly good at either of those things, but it's important because people have to know what we're doing or what we're for. Okay, next slide. So the author illustrates five reasons that these are important. And I think these are a really nice way to look at this. Because of fellowship, churches grow warmer through fellowship. That's, what, that's the feel good stuff. That's what makes us wanna be here. We grow deeper in our faith through discipleship, through the Bible studies, the prayer, the prayer times that we have together, through the book studies. Churches grow stronger through worship. Churches grow broader through ministry. Our reach is wider into the community and into the world. And churches grow larger through evangelism. And whether that's still that icky feeling of evangelism or just marketing. We grow larger because people know that we're here and that church is at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. That's, that's just spreading the word. In order to grow larger, we have to tell people that we're here and what we're doing. So in an ideal world, each of these pillars is sort of balanced. A really healthy church has strong worship. It has education programs. It has really strong ministry in the community. Um, and it has good fellowship and it's out spreading the word in the community. Um, the author in the context I read um, reminded us that that is not the reality. Almost any church is pushed in one direction. So if you look at um, kind of a televangelist church, they're so hyper-focused on evangelism or maybe discipleship that they're completely min 
often min, uh, missing the the ministry part, the justice work that goes in the community, all of those things. Oftentimes, a particular pastor that comes into a church has a gift in one or two areas, and because we rely on the pastor sometimes, sometimes we shift to one area. And I think maybe for those of us who have been in this church long enough, we can see where that is maybe shifted over different times with different pastors. Um, you can do the next slide. The author sort of has nicknamed um, churches who are really heavily centered on one. So the evangelism church is going to be that soul winning church. That's that televangelist <laughs> style church you can imagine that looks like. A really worship focused church is going to be the experiencing God church. The fellowship church is titled the family reunion church. That might just feel like you're at a social club if it's almost all fellowship. We're just here to be friends with each other. A discipleship is the classroom church. We focused a lot of time on just learning, reading the Bible, you know, even sometimes like forum could feel like a classroom church at the time we spent a year. This is education. And the social conscious church. This is the ministry church. And you can pull up the next one because my gut is this is where we are. <laughs> this is where who we are is a social conscious. So this says this is the church that is out to change society. It is full of activists who are doers of the word or world. It comes in both a liberal and conservative version, which I like that the author pointed this out. The liberal version, which that's likely going to be us, right, tends to focus on the injustice in our society, while the conservative version probably focuses on the moral decline in our society. So while we're very different, we might know other churches that have this ethos, but their theology is quite different than ours. Um, both the feel of the church, uh, the um, both feel the church should be a major player in the political process. So that's when we're sending out action alerts. We're encouraging people to go out and march. That's kind of a lot of what we have historically done and what our justice team is pushing us to do. There's always a current crusade or cause that the church is involved in. I don't think this has been the case in many years, but the pastor in a church like this would see their role and says his because it's a conservative. So just ignore that. As a past as a prophet and reformer. Important terms in this church are need, serve, share, minister, take a stand, get out there, get on your feet, and do something. Does that feel like kind of what if we were going to be out there, that's kind of what we would do, or maybe what we were doing in the in the days of TAMPs and other programs? <laughs> okay, let's move to the next one. However, that is not reflected in where we put our money and energy. So I want to still like lean back to the point that we should be balanced, but I also want to highlight the fact that I have not seen anything in the notes that we've taken in the last four or five weeks to say we don't want to be a justice or ministry church. So that still feels true. Does that feel true? We still want to have a strong focus on ministry, whether it's justice, it's feet on the ground, giving money, doing service. Yet only 2% of our budgeted is allocated to any sort of benevolence. That's money we give the justice team to sign on to things, give money. That's money we send to Cameron. That's staff time, et cetera. And yeah, well, the money we give Presbytery that we sort of have to do, that's in a different, that's not included. Well, the money we give for mission to the Presbytery is included there. Yes, but not the, how does that feel? Does that surprising? Yeah. So one of the things I want us to do today and to look at, and I'm going to pass out, um, this is not, this, this is my version of the budget. <laughs> okay. So it's putting categories. What I want us to do today is to look at starting to build what our priorities are. We're not going to do the big picture, long-term thinking, but I want us to start thinking about if we were going to build on our own organization, our own church, Again, even if it looks very similar to what we've done, what are our priorities? Where do we have the physical energy that we want to be placed? Where do we actually want our money to go? Then once we have some of those ideas, then we can start to lay the groundwork of what that future would look like. So I'm going to ask Nancy to pass this around. You'll see on the third page, I had a, an error, so I hand wrote it in. I'm going to save one of these. And those on the computer, I will email this and put it on um, eConnect later today. So when I received the budget earlier this year, um, I was, and I've seen it before, but it, it continues to astound me and worry me deeply. Um, 
I almost brought a hammer to say that I'm going to lay down the hammer a little bit, which is in no context I've ever been affiliated, whether it's a business, a nonprofit, a church, or a government organization, is this budget acceptable? <laughs> this is dire. <laughs> it is not like any budget. So I, you have three pages here. The first one is our overall budget. What I've done, I've not changed any of the numbers. What I've done is put them into what I think our regular category. So the first line is just the first three lines on the first page are all income, congregational offerings, um, facility income, and then there's like an other category. I don't know what that is. And then what I've done is tried to break them into three different categories, administrative, true congregational expenses, and facility expenses. And then the second two pages are a breakdown of the congregational. That's gonna be, um, the second page is the facility and the third page is congregational. Sorry, the titles didn't get put there. And the reason I did that is that I think it's just important for us to start to see what does it cost us to be a congregation separate from what it costs to operate this building and run the business of, of what it was, was our number fits you? What number are we fits you? 121 and what it means to be 121 fits you. And I say that because we can't ascertain yet if our congregation itself is out of balance financially versus the building. So I wanted to look at both of those. So the first that I'll draw your attention to on the first page is that, as I mentioned earlier, is we only cover 40% of the overall um, income of our budget through our actual income. 60% of our budget is pulled from endowment. And that's very atypical. I would say even in a large university like Harvard that has billions of dollars, I'd, I'd have to look it up, but I would imagine it's maybe 20%, you know, might come from the billions of dollars that Harvard has in endowment. Um, so it's very atypical that that much. So it's less concerning to me how much the dollars are coming out as it is that how much of the budget. It just shows that we are not sustainable. Now, the second page is looking at facilities. And you'll see is that um, very similarly for facilities, we're only covering about just under that 39% of like the true facilities. And what I've done for this is I've assumed, I've made an assumption, this is not reality. I made an assumption about 50% of the administrative staff and all of the papers and everything need to cover the fact that we own this building, have all these tenants and maybe 50% of that is for the benefit of congregational, putting out the newsletter, um, sitting at the front desk, all of those things, the parts of Eileen's time that benefit the church. But on the facility side, I assumed maybe 75% benefits the tenants and 25% is there. So these are just rough figures. And one of the things I have as a takeaway is to see if Session thinks maybe we could do some recording they would better illustrate over the next year how much of that is. So for example, Ed was in here doing work today. Ed could write on his timesheet today, four hours of my day was setting up forum, cleaning, getting coffee hours set up. So X number of dollars this week was for Ed's time versus Eileen's time. And then X number, it's very typical in an organization they have different classes and QuickBooks that you can put through. So this part is for the congregation, this part is for tenants, Maybe this part is for community events. We could actually have an accounting of what we're looking at because this is just, I don't know, just doesn't look good, but I don't know what, what part is worse than better. And on the third page, and I'll let you have some time to look at this and ask questions after this. Third page is what I'm assuming congregational is. So offerings, that's, that's prim primarily what our income is that we can make a case. Maybe some of that facility income really benefits the congregation. And then what are the true congregational expenses? Obviously the pastor, obviously all of our music staff, our Christian ed staff, benevolences, and then that 25% of what it costs to run the facility and 50% of the admin. So when you look at that, this is even worse, which means only about 28% of, of our congregational costs are covered by our offerings and about 72% of kind of just a congregational budget. But then that assumes a pretty high amount of admin and facility expenses. So that might not be accurate. 
And the last thing I'll point out is I reached out to two congre actually reached out to three, but I heard from back from two congregations, which are similar in size to us. Those ones are actually a little bit bigger than us. Um, and I agreed not to share their name. One is a suburban church, uh, very active, has had a lot of growth in the last couple of years, is doing really well, has about 169 members. And one is a large town, not super far extended from our presbytery, has about 187 members. And I asked them to share their budgets. So you're gonna see those in the columns between there. So they have fairly similar income amounts. So it looks like their members are probably tithing similar to we are. So we're, you know, we're not being cheap here at downtown. They're getting a similar amount of income into there, but you can see their expenses. Yeah, and maybe their pastoral compensation is a little bit lower than ours, but I don't, that's not really the part that it's off. Um, you can see some major differences in music compensation. That's, we pay a tremendous amount more because we, we're, I think we're the only church I know in the Presbytery that pays people in a choir to certainly pay their music director, pay their organist, things like that. But we are very rare that we pay musicians. You know, if you go to third, they have 45 people in their choir. Those are all members. I can't sing. I'm not going to offer that I join the choir, but just I'm pointing that out that it is abnormal for a congregation. Many of them have more Sunday school teachers, so they have higher learning compensation. So they balance out. The biggest difference is in administrative and facility costs. So I think that our numbers are actually skewed. I don't think that um, at this point, Eileen or Keisha are spending a significant amount of their time actually doing things that are for this church. I don't think it's taking 40 hours a week for Keisha to do, you know, send out newsletters or do the bulletin. I think a lot of the work is actually happening is for the tenants. Um, I think the same thing with the building. So I think one of the things we need to look at is how much is that actually of all of those time is actually being spent there. So we have an, a more accurate picture. Um, the other thing we could look at is, um, which I went to look at is if we were to rent our, um, our sanctuary. So we have a rate up on the website for what we charge for a wedding. I can't remember what it is, maybe $500,000. So if we were to rent our sanctuary for the number of hours a year we're in the sanctuary, what would it cost us to rent our own space? How does that compare to what we actually pay if we were renting it? So that might be because another entity owns it, or it might just because it's an idea of the amount of time we're using our space versus that. So I'm going to leave it there. That was a little bit of time. We have an exercise we're going to do after this, but I want to ask, spend some time to ask questions on what I put out here or um, concerns, other observations from these numbers. <laughs> We'll give it a couple minutes because we're looking at numbers. Um, the two percent of the budget going to benevolence is the thing that that struck me immediately is it's very easy to give money and we could give 50%, but the important thing that doesn't show in that is all the time that people are spending doing the justice things. Yep. So time is, is very, a very big consideration. Absolutely. When we do the exercise we're going to do at the end of our time together, you know, there's, you'll see there's pieces of paper behind Carolyn there. Um, we're going to, we're going to look at the different functions we could do within those five pillars and I put on there, how much do we think this is going to cost and how much time do we think it's going to take? And then the last question is going to be who's, who's willing to help because we both have, we actually have less of a money problem. We have plenty of money in the bank. We're just spending too much of it, maybe in the wrong places, but we also have, we have a labor problem. There are many of you in this room who have been giving your all for decades and I'm looking around at you and I'm looking at people and you, you can't give 50 hours a week anymore <laughs> to do this. And then there's some of us who have not been here quite as long, myself and Raina and Nancy, but we also have jobs and we can't give 50 hours a week either. So we have to be realistic about what we actually can do and want to do. That's going to be the other part. I, I think Elaine wants to do it. <laughs> Just a comment. Excuse me. I'm I'm one of those who hasn't been here forever. Uh, I I think I I joined in 2006 or something like that. And immediately, uh, Gail pulled me onto Justice, and I've lived there uh, since then. 
So I'm remembering the years that I spent on session um, <clears throat> as someone representing justice and the, the plans that we would from time to time come up with to dedicate certain funds um, and and then and and I think it was Pat at that time who was really good in suggesting well maybe justice could dedicate this amount and challenge session to match that uh, and that would always I don't know about always but so often lead to uh, um, being challenged about. Remember, Elaine, that that everything that we spend comes out of our um, endowment. Thank you, and um, and 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 we're you know it's shrinking, so we have to be very careful. And one of the things that I that I do believe that's happened since then is that we used to have a session benevolence fund. Do, you, you've got to remember that, that, that I was told that we don't. Um, and, and I'd like to know that because the session, I, if, forgive me if I brought, I'm like a broken record on this because I, I just feel so, so, so deeply about it that, um, when we would receive, um, um, endowment money, um, when someone passes away and, and has left, certain monies to the church, 10% of that would go into this session endowment, session benevolence fund, sorry. Um, and, and then we, we could, that was dedicated to, to spending outside of our congregation in, in the community. Um, and, and that was always sort of a struggle to get that approved, but, but it, it did, session would, would approve those. Um, and then when I learned that we don't have that fund any longer, um, I don't know. It's it, it was it was a great disappointment for me because I, I I really thought that that was a wonderful thing to do. I think when we have, I think Sam is going to come in a couple of weeks, right? Let's make a note of that. If Nancy, I don't know who's taking notes, but okay, let's make a note for both. I mean. Yeah, somebody can ask that on session, but we can ask that question. It might just be in a spot we don't see. So the budget that I'm looking at, that doesn't have every single line item. I, I see music compensation on the approved budget. I don't see what Lee's salary is versus, you know, so it's not super detailed. So that might be in there somewhere, but I think we should um, take a look. So how many of you like me have a personal budget? Any of you have a, have a spreadsheet? I spent a lot of time looking at it, especially because I just took a job that has a significant pay cut. <laughs> Um, so, you know, has somebody who took a pay cut and has to be more stringent. I just went through the really difficult decision of figuring out what was a priority in my life and what could go. So I, I like lots of nice things in my life and I had back problems. So I was, had a membership to massage envy and I was getting a massage for the last two years every month because I needed to do it. The massage had to go because I took a $15,000 pay cut. I had to decide that my going out to eat budget had to decrease. Unfortunately, I dropped a few organizations that I give money to. I had to prioritize church and the food pantry and one place. I stopped giving to where I go to college. I figured they could live without the $100 or $200 a year. They've got plenty of people. We have to prioritize and we have to be real about it. And it is not personal. If we decide at some point, hey, our pastor is running the same size church as the suburban church. Maybe that's not what we can afford in our budget anymore. Maybe we have to go to an 80%. Maybe we can't make this, maybe we have to trim a little bit on music. Maybe we have to cut and we have to let some parts of the facilities go. It is uncomfortable, but unfortunately it is our budget. It's not some treasure. It's not Sam's budget. It's not the pastor's budget. That's that's the session and finance committee session. And ultimately the congregation are the ones who have to, to do that work. And so what my ask is today is not that we make judgments about when well, someone says making too much money or we're spending too much money here is that we don't start with what we want to cut. We start with what is the priority, right? So when I look at my personal budget, whether it's my priority or not, I have to pay my mortgage and I have to pay my car payment 
Those are, you know, I have to pay my taxes. Those are the first three things I have to do. Other things I have to, yeah, unfortunately I have to have my dog. My dog has to get fed. I can wear the same outfit all year if I need to. I could live on rice and beans if I need to, but there are certain things we have to do. We have to pay our utilities at the church. If we have an agreement with our pastor, we have to pay that money. But what we do with the rest of the money, we need to be thinking more about what is our priority. What are we called to do? So I'm going to have you switch to the next slide, David. I'm not going to read this, but actually go to the next one. So in thinking about a scripture, I came to John 15. Are you all familiar with that? That's I am the vine. So in this, it's Jesus's words. And he talks about that God has called us to, and that's why when I gave the, um, I prayed at the beginning of the meeting, I talked about you know, everything that's come before being nourishment for what's to come. But that also means pruning. I hate pruning trees, but I have bushes and trees in my yard and I've got to trim them back so that they grow correctly. And our congregation is no different. And so this is the very end of, I think this is verses 16 and 17. And I think this is an important part to remind that again, nothing is an accident. This is all part of God's plan and it's how we participate in it. So Jesus says, from God, you didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bears, whatever you ask the father creator, which is the creator, in relation to me, he or she gives you. We have a purpose individually and in this congregation to do this work. The only thing that we can do that's wrong it's to put our heads under the pillow or in the sand and say, somebody else is going to figure it out. There is no end to good work that we can do in this church, through worship, through ministry. We have a ton of money somewhere that can be used for something. We just need to be proactive in what it looks like. And unfortunately, we're kind of looking around at the people this is. This is about half the active people are probably sitting in this room, right? We have 160 members, but we really have 40 to 60 like people who show up and are active, are serving on committees, are doing work. When we were 500, 600 members, I'd be like, no, I think Mary's going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Somebody like Session will do that. It's pretty much us. We are the people. So we can't, this is, and this happens in the presbytery a lot. You hear people say, well, the presbytery should do this or the presbytery should do that. And Susan or as a presbytery leader is constantly reminding us there is no you. It's we. There's nobody else that's going to do this. We can't say the government should do this. It's it's not that far apart. It is very close. It is we. So what do we want to do? And what don't we want to do? I'm not quiet. I'll tell you what I don't want to do. I can tell you where I want to cut. And I think we need to ha start having those conversations. But what I have for today is on that table behind Carolyn, and this is, I'm sorry for the people who are on Zoom and what we can do, I could ask David, um, if you can put in chat ideas you have about um, different things. So what I have over there is five pieces of paper and they correspond to those five pillars, fellowship, ministry, discipleship, evangelism, I think it was at all of them, and worship. And what I've done is on each of those papers, actually, Karen, would you mind bringing me one just so that I can remember what I wrote on it? There's four or five columns. And what I did is I took no items that came up in the notes that we either want or we miss that used to happen at the past. And I put them in here and I added a couple things that I remember. So for example, this is fellowship. So the first column is what's the program or initiative. The second column is how much will it cost? Third column is how many hours will it take? How much, who, and then the fourth column is who will help. We're not going to fill out all these columns today, but what I'd like you to do is if you have an idea of an activity that we've either done before or you think we can do again to add it to this list and whether it's already written on here or somebody else writes in it and you're willing to help, you could fill in that category. And then we can go back to the committees who work on this and we can get an idea. So for example, for fellowship, I put in the Advent Festival, the old standbys, Harvest Dinner, Strawberry Festival, Camp Whitman outing, hiking outings. And I put coffee hour in here. The reason I put coffee hour, this is a pretty low hanging fruit in terms of expense. Maybe minus third prez, 
no churches have their facility staff make the coffee and get everything ready. That's a volunteer position. So there's things like that at the size of our church anymore. It is, it doesn't make sense for us to pay people to do them. Those are things that's like paying. If we paid for um, Keisha to come on Sundays and hand out the bulletins. No, we have greeters. That's a, that's a service position. That's what we do. So we could go back and we could easily go in and say, well, the Advent festival, the last time we did the Advent festival, like it probably didn't cost us anything, but maybe it cost us $500 in materials and arts and craft supplies. Last time we did the harvest dinner and we can figure out how many hours, but I want to know what, what is it that's on your hearts that you think we should continue to do? And are you willing to participate in these? And you'll have to see similar things on the, on the ministry sheet and the worship sheet. Um, and then, um, what I think you're going to find is that most of these things we want to do actually cost very little money. They're going to still take up, even with adding them, are going to add very little to the budget. There, there's much we can do that is not adding expense or time. The things that are the big expense to us are the albatrosses, the building, the administrative costs. But let's start and focus on what we want to do and add more before we start taking it away. Does that sound good? All right, let's go ahead. We've got sheets here. Um, and then maybe those online could send some in some chat. We could take some notes and put them on there. So, <laughs> uh, the five categories are fellowship. There each, there's one, one sheet for each of those categories. Yep. You can walk around. Yep. Fellowship, discipleship, worship. Ministry, evangelism. I think the perspective should come from is what's on your heart that you want to do. Yeah, personally or the church, yeah. Because what happens is we we have all these side conversations, right? I'm in the hallway with Becky and I'm like, oh, I miss... I miss us doing the harvest dinner together. Right. <laughs> and I do, but it's there, but there's no formal motion to say, we want to go back and do that. Or, or is that a priority? We want to pick three events this year or justice, you know, and justice are saying, I wish we had more money. I wish, you know, people, people spent more time thinking about what we're going to do. So what this is, this is saying, it's the start of saying before we bring it to the congregation and say, which of these things is the most important? Can we pick 10, 12 things that we want to focus on in the year ahead? Mary. I think it's interesting that uh, one of the, there's a couple, but one of the committees that is currently has no chair and there is no committee for is what what we have been calling the engagement committee, mm -hmm. which is the committee that, that mm -hmm. oversees the harvest dinner mm -hmm. and the Advent festival and all of those things. So if that really is a priority, we're currently not... Yeah. Not staffing it with our volunteers. And I would say that it has declined since there has not been a committee because there's not been attention. <laughs> yeah. But there was some good, I think Becky was still leading, uh, Becky Wiggins was still leading that committee. Afterwards for a while. For a yeah. while. And there was yeah. hiking outings and other things happening. That's right. But yeah. since there has not been leadership. Since Becky left, there hasn't been. And anything. I think we know the last two years, the Advent Festival has been here. There have been more people in church than any other Sunday mm -hmm. on those days. On the 50th anniversary celebration, there was more people in church and more people. In, I, I could not find a negative comment anywhere on either of those days when the Advent Festival was there and we did the 50th anniversary. Those are no-brainers. We clearly want to do them, right? <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead, walk around, have conversations. If you want to tell me something, I can write it down. We can pass them around as well. And what's what we're just going to do, we're going to spend some time. We can continue to have conversation, pass the mic around. Mm -hmm. okay. Lynn? Oh, oh, <laughs> um, uh, been thinking about the 2% budget. And does that include um, the subsidizing we do for, for rents for organizations in here? 
So I am not aware of what the subsidy is. I think that's a number we'd have to get if we have an actual number. Because I think that that could count as benevolence. Some some organizations are rent free yep. and others have reduced rates. Yeah, I think we'd have to get a calculation of that and then categorize that in a certain way so that... Um, that might get us a bit higher than 2%. Yeah, so for example, at camp, we give away scholarships, but I count those scholarship numbers and present those and they're shared. So it's shown as it's a loss, you know, that's not income coming in, but it's work that we're doing. So we could and, be showing that. And it is a benevolence and yes, a scholarship. Yeah. Right? But I think we also have empty space. So it's kind of like our congregation. If there are, it costs X amount to run this space and you sort of need X number of members contributing to have a congregation of a certain size, we probably have to have a certain amount of renters to make the building make sense, even if, and knowing that a certain percentage of them are subsidized, we don't have to cover all that. We can charge a tenant that can pay more, more and say, you're helping to subsidize another organization that needs that too. We don't have to bear that all on our shoulders. Other people can pay for that. And that's a story we can tell our congregation. We say, part of what you're giving is subsidizing these organizations are doing this work. Do you want to contribute more to the church because of that? We actually don't do a good job. We do a very bad job, actually, of how we ask for money. Church people are really bad at fundraising. And we have good work we're doing. There's a good call for what we're doing. But for example, for the years that I was helping run the Harvest Dinner, et cetera, every other church is charging five dollars ten dollars in the door to pay for those dinners and they're using it as a fundraiser come to our harvest dinner come to our chicken barbecue we're going to give that money to cameron we're going to give that money to teen uh teen empowerment i can pay five or ten dollars and if somebody can't they can still come in and have that but we've always been like nope it's free but we can use those opportunities to raise money we can Put, we can do a special giving on any Sunday and say, this is money we're going to give to World Kitchen to you know send to Palestine. We have to ask. <laughs> I want to say one of the reasons why Camp Whitman's still here is because Leah is an excellent fundraiser mm -hmm. and very energetic and, mm -hmm. and really did a lot to make the facility and the program so much better and deeper. Thanks. And I want to say that when we've put out a special plea for something, this is a church that responds. Yes. There was a, a wonderful response for the well in the village for the, the girls' high school from yes. the church. The church gave $1,000, and then we also asked congregants to to contribute, in, and they did. Mm -hmm. You know, we and we've done that time and time again. Yes. Yeah. I, I love the idea of making that part of of our of our dinners of of what we pay for that. I think we don't we don't we haven't had the feeling for a while now that we're participating in mission. Yeah. And and even that is is a way of feeling like you're participating in mission. You're getting your lunch, you're getting the program, and you know that you've helped do a little piece of good. Mm -hmm. I think the last thing that I've seen with that is the commitment to teen empowerment. When there was a commitment to make a significant contribution, to have a table at the dinner, to have teen empowerment in here for forums. So if we can focus in on a couple key types of ministry work that we want to do, I think we can make the case that says we want to put a significant amount of our budget each year in the endowment to be a key player in these. And then it'll be exciting to be, to go and volunteer at the organizations too, to participate. <laughs> Do you know how it is that Trinity um, Emmanuel, mm -hmm. they, they have what, three Saturdays a month or two Saturdays a month where they have breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. Where does that funding come from? Do you know? I'm guessing it comes from either private fundraising in the church or probably getting donations of the food. And it's fairly easy, you know, as I'm on the board of a food pantry to get donations of the raw ingredients. And then, mm -hmm. so it's volunteers, you know, it's just us making food. And then if you can get the raw ingredients. Yeah. I'm, I'm told that they, they serve up to 70 people a Saturday yeah. when they, um, when they do this. 
Yeah. An idea I had recently was, um, as many of you know, a lot of kids exist on free breakfast and lunch programs in schools, but when they go home on weekends and breaks, they don't have free breakfast or lunch. So they're just hungry. And what would it look like in our giant kitchen to do a program, either a sandwich program or a meal program on Saturdays and Sundays where we had volunteers who came in and provided meals to the kids who live in this community or outwards or brought them to Cameron community. We have a lot of resources in this building that we could use. I'm wondering where pastoral care fits into the five pillars. Yep. What was that? She wonders where pastoral yes. care yeah, thank fits. Thank you, because you came to ask me that question then I got, got pulled away. I would say that that is in ministry. It's internal ministry, but it's it's ministry. And I think it's that's a key part of, um, and then within the context of our system, you know, obviously the deacons play a key role in that. And then as well as it's an important part of the pastor's role, but I would say it's in ministry. Right now. Well, yeah, I just want to thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, this is like so wonderful for my brain because I feel like I can finally wrap my head around everything that I've been learning these past mm -hmm. few years about how things are changing in our church. And I want to just submit to everyone that it's really important too for our youth to be engaged. And I know that that is something near and dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. And when we think of volunteers and things like that, I, I'm constantly looking for like things for my kids to do. <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. go over there, pour that, do that, help them go here. And my kids love it. You know, mm -hmm. they love being a part of something and feeling like there's actually something for them to give back to their church. Jai said to me last week, he's like, mom, like, this is my church. Like mm -hmm. I can come here. I can always come here. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you can always come here. And he was like, okay, good. That makes me feel good. And I, I think of when you're saying basically, like if we have these opportunities, people are going to come. And I think of opportunities for kids to serve, you know, if we had something like, you know, the harvest dinner come back or things on the weekend and we tap that resource of kids because they may, you may not see them here, but they're like, they'll come if we have something, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that, um, especially the older kids, they can do a lot mm -hmm. to help people. And I'm thinking even with members of our church that are older and maybe are having difficulty doing things at home. That's something that, you know, I want to put out to you that I have two very able-bodied 14 year olds <laughs> and like, seriously, you need your leaves raked. You need anything. Like I want us to have that internal service, that internal ministry, um, where we really can help each other. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. I would encourage us to also start looking, you can sign up for any church's newsletter. So because I once a third, once or twice before I became a member here, I still get thirds newsletter. So I see what they're doing every day. I, I f follow on Facebook, a number of churches because of my work with the youth group, et cetera. So see what other people are doing. There's really cool programs happening. Like Pittsburgh does an amazing grief program. They have a program for um, widows and widowers that they do throughout the year. Um, those aren't high cost events. It's a group that's a gathering that happens. Um, there's really great youth programs happening at some churches. There's really great dinners and churches of all sizes. So one of my favorite churches is the East Avon church is, you know, way down. And there's actually two Presbyterian churches in Avon Central, which is where I grew up going to church in East Avon, which is at the Four Corners. And uh, Michelle Allen is their new pastor there. And she is a vibrant, a vibrant pastor. They do fundraisers and they fund all, they have, a, they have like 15 kids in their youth group in the small little town. They only have like 80 members in their church. They have pulled people from in the community. They have a huge LBGTQI centered youth group. So kids who come in just for safe space, they provided a program. There is like a safe zone in Livingston County where people can come in teens who, um, 
or LBGTQIA can come in and they do programs. They do, they fundraise everything for those youth programs at churches and have money. So those kids are doing car washes and bake sales and they're, they will send anybody they want to camp. They do retreats. So it's all possible. It's just, I think looking at where that, what other people are doing and what sounds good to us. Leah, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, one of the things that seemed to be brought up several times in the last couple of weeks was how to use the building mm -hmm. as a means of ministry mm -hmm. um, to provide it uh, either as radical as, you know, remodeling it for housing, mm -hmm. but also to um, to make it a, a place where people who want to have a... Um, is space um, that, but and then my question has always been just how that is related to a church's mission as opposed to a community's mission, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a a challenge to us. Um, yep, I decided not to get into that today because we couldn't do both the things, <laughs> and I didn't want to do anything that we couldn't do well today. I have one idea that I'd like to share in regards to that. My idea would be that we separately incorporate this building, whether it's under the name downtown center or something else. And that building, the building gets sold to a new entity of which a certain number of church members might have to be in the declaration of that new organization on the board for a set number of years. And that, that entity hires its own executive director and has its own mission. And then it's very clear what that does. So outside of the church incorporation, which involves lots of other different things, but a nonprofit that is allowed to think more clearly, and it could be members that of the church that have certain spots. So for example, Camp Whitman, it has to have a certain number of members from each presbytery, and then there's so many community members that could be on that. So you can, you can set that up in your bylaws of what you want that structure to be. So some work could be done with the consultant to figure out, you know, what are the broad visions of what? this center can be, who are the type of tenants we want to have, what kind of work that is, but not have that happen within the framework of the congregation because we do not have enough energy for this group of people to create a whole, I mean, this is probably a multi-million dollar nonprofit that would be running a space like that. And I just don't feel like we have enough energy and talent and time to do that work now, but we do have the brains to put together the vision of what something like that could be. So there's probably some other examples. I think there's some other churches that have similar centers at other places, but that would give us the opportunity if the Presbytery allowed us to, to get out from under the building, but have in a, in a clause that we would have, you know, X number of years tenancy at X rate. That's pretty typical that you can do that. So we could say, you know, we have a 50 year life lease on being in the building if we wanted to. That's all possible. <laughs> and the endowment would then be seed money for that? The endowment could be seed money. It could be separate. You know, those conversations could happen at the same time. <laughs> I, I just spent the last few days working on the agenda for, for Tuesday. And, you know, you know, too, I, I know I was just thinking about the percentage of the agenda that is about building mm -hmm. and the very small percentage of the agenda month after month that is really about the life of the church and the congregation mm -hmm. it's and and it has to be that way as long as we're running the building i'm not saying that 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 <laughs> that we really have a choice now but mm -hmm. it's it's very you know it's very clear that we as we are currently constituted we have to spend a huge amount of time and and resources and energy on on things that are related to the building itself and our and our renders and everything that goes along with it yeah can i just ask clarification on your idea you said i thought you said separate the property into two buildings and this building or were you talking about the entire no i'm saying self incorporate a new nonprofit that potentially becomes an owner of the building and then administers the mission of all of the other things okay so that allows the our owner congregation of the whole campus yeah not just it allows our congregation to act as a congregation and probably as a tenant in relation to the building but probably have seats 
on the board of whatever that is so that there's it's continuing to stay in our what we desire to happen <laughs> um i can look some up yeah did you have something um, I was just going to echo what Mary just said about the agenda, percentage of the agenda. Part of the Susan Orr, John Dorhauer book study was our homework one week was to get a copy of each of our church's agenda, agenda, yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> agenda um, to illustrate exactly that. How much of the time on the agenda, just, just time slots, just mm -hmm. timekeeping is spent on uh, church building business versus congregation and community building. So when I share those those other budgets from those other churches, they're still swimming in the, their churches are still too big for them because they've decreased. But those are like any church you're going to see on a main street community that has, you know, their sanctuary holds 200 people. What does ours hold? 500, 600? I don't know. It's a, we can hold 500. Yeah. So, you know, we have 45 to 50 people in church on a Sunday in a space that holds 500. So we're using 10% of that space. Versus even these churches that are in a space that hold 200 and have 80 people in church on a Sunday, you know, we are having to manage the space, just the con just the sanctuary alone, which is only 10% of what we need, uh, you know, and then the whole rest of this, but it's way too much to manage. And I think that's why some of these churches that are able, even though they're small and they have their own struggles, they're more appropriately sized for the buildings they are in. So I'm not saying we need to move, but how do we... How do we create a relationship that allows that? So it's, for example, if I lived in a 5,000 square foot house and I became widowed and I had no kids, A, I might downsize or B, I might decide maybe I'm going to have my grandkids move in or maybe I'm going to take a roommate on because this is this is an inappropriate size building for me to live in anymore. <laughs> Close this, is, this is, oh, I didn't thought how to yeah. attend um, Just to echo... Raina's comment uh, about you know, putting numbers and kind of making some of this a little more concrete. I'm really paraphrasing what you were saying, made it, made what you meant, but this is, I think, really good fodder for what we're looking forward to hearing from Sam mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, the finance committee and where monies go, how much of it goes, what of it, what parts of it go to exactly which kind of programming, um, you know, those kinds of pieces. So I'm, I, this is, this is kind of kickstarting a lot of, or continuing that kind of um, thought process. I will take those sheets and I will type them up and put them maybe even in a Google sheet so people could online enter more in there. And I can work with Sam on starting to do some of the numbers of what, what do our programs we want to do cost us? I mean, I think we could maybe only be adding 10 or $20,000 a year to do more, which is a drop in the bucket for our budget and just ask for the ask session for the funding to do the little extra and then figure out and how it's, to trim down. <laughs> and it sounds like with session asking administrative folks to identify what percentage of what as the example you gave Ed will be very helpful to say helpful to say, well, this program actually takes this, 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 you know, Sunday mm -hmm. forum or coffee hour or mm -hmm. those kinds of things if we don't already have those numbers. Yeah. Oh, one last question. Session. Did, has session already broached this idea of incorporating or are they, is that not really I've not, something? I've, that's been, I've only brought up. that up socially to people that I think session is really focused. Mary can, and Raina who are on session and, and, and David can weigh in really focused right now on getting Phil in and kind of starting these next process. So this is all just data still can take as he begins to work with session on kind of what that sound correct to you. Like we just got to get Phil in the door. <laughs> yeah. These past five weeks, I think have been helpful if Phil is willing to look back on what we've done here. Um, you know, we defined all those, problems which is what we've been talking about these past five weeks but boy he's <laughs> um i suspect he understood this is what he was getting into yeah yeah but let's also remember he's not going to solve it immediately so let's give some, some grace <laughs> well thank you for allowing me to share uh, next next week uh we have uh david orange coming to talk about the science of gratitude mm. uh, every week he uh 
has uh, a lecture on some topic uh, at at the Meadows. Um, very interactive. Um, he he does a presentation and pauses, asks for feedback, comments. Uh, so this will be a good audience for him, and uh, it's an important topic. And as I sat, what I thought, you know, this would be good for for our congregation too. So I suggest you get here on time because he does move it at a clip, but it'll be very stimulating. And uh, he brings in things from YouTube and other places. Uh, I don't think there's too much controversy in this. He's not. But on some of his presentations, he'll bring in far ranging views and attitudes. Um, and the whole idea is to get people to think. Um, but this is an important thing to think about, too. Uh, so I'm grateful that he's uh, willing to come. And uh, I'm grateful that he will have a good audience here. So uh, please be sure to get here and try to get here on time if you can. And thank you, Leah, for a wonderful presentation today. <laughs> so well organized. <laughs>